encourage out in the hallway there if you'd like to take home some Sunday to go out um, and, uh, and pray for the work. Um, we're doing a lot of open air work at the minute. Um, I find that if you stand on an hour at Tesla in Dunyan, uh, you reach a thousand people. Um, a thousand people in your, con- in your congregation. And you think of those areas like Galilee and Chapa and Coal Island around Dunyan. Um, those people are coming into Tesco and you're getting them all in one place. Wonderful opportunity to reach to reach people at Tesco and Car Park. And there's no problem. Uh, we're not uh, we're not breaking any rules. Church is allowed to continue. In fact, we've been encouraged to take the church service out of the building. <laughs> and that's what we're doing at Tesco. We're having church outside the building. And so um, there's not really anything to say about us during this lockdown with regards to that. But not only in the busy towns, not, like, not only in Tesco, but uh, we're taking to the, the villages as well with the open airs. Um, I'm not sure if you got the tax sent you, Gilbert, um, but we were in Ross Lake uh, on Thursday, and we did every home with a John's Gospel and a Gospel Tract. And um, I was chatting to your brother as well, uh, Rob. And uh, we had an open air in the town as well before we left. And I don't know if you know much about Ross Lake, but it would be fairly Republican village, but no problem at all. People were coming out and listening to the word. And uh, so the Lord's blessing that they are working with got to take advantage of the freedom whilst we still have in the days in which to work we're living. So again, thank you so much for allowing me to come along uh, this evening and to share a few thoughts from God's word. We're going to turn tonight to Psalm 130. Psalm 130. Pestilence. The greatest pestilence of all, of course, 
is the virus of sin. And we pray, Lord, that you open these, the eyes of our politicians. Lord, we are almost a year into this pestilence and still we're waiting for a call from a, just one call from one politician for their prayer. And we're still waiting. Now that's not to say that we don't have Christians in the room, we do. But we're still waiting. Well, we thank the Lord tonight that you have a remnant that still prays. And we thank the Lord for the prayer meeting that will be going on here on Thursday night, Lord, in this little room. And we pray that you'll draw near to your people. Bless your people. Answer the prayers of your people. And cover this fellowship in the blood to Bless every family associated with this fellowship. Keep us safe from all danger, all iniquity, all disease. We look to you. You're the great physician. And certainly if we can trust you to take us to heaven the moment that we die, we can trust you to keep us safe from the virus. Lord, draw very near to us this evening as we have this great privilege to Examine your word. And we pray that you will speak to us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, some have tried to make this psalm justify their false doctrine of purgatory. As if the psalmist David here was speaking of himself. Or speaking rather on behalf of the dead. But of course... David wasn't speaking on behalf of the dead. David was speaking of himself, who at this time was still very much alive. He called upon God and he exhorted his people Israel to do exactly the same thing. As we know, God's word does not teach you about a place called purgatory. The idea is that souls would go there to pay for their sins until they're pure enough to enter into heaven. But of course we know tonight that that is fake news, that is a false gospel. A satanic deception to brainwash people into thinking that even if they don't make it into heaven the first time around, then they will have another opportunity to earn a place in heaven in that pretend place called purgatory. But you know, my friend, the Bible, God's word is very clear to see. Beyond the grave, there is no second chances and there is no more opportunities. There is heaven for the saved, there is hell for the lost. It is appointed unto men most of them. And after this, not purgatory, but after this, the judgment. So according to God, if you were to die tonight without Jesus Christ as your Savior, then before the rhythm mortis would set in, before your neighbors would be told, before the undertaker would come to straighten out your body, and before your carcass is put into that long wooden box, you won't be in purgatory at all. You'll be in hell. You'll be in hell in the way of there are three things here in the psalm that I want us to look at this evening. First of all, we see here in verse 24, the appeal that is made to the Saviour. Verse 1, out of the depths have I cried unto thee, O Lord. You know, I think it's fair to say that we tend to pray most when we're in a state of despair and not when things are going well. When things are going well for the sinner, then God is always the last thing that's on their mind. Satan knows this very well. So he will give the sinner riches and he will give them fame and fortune. He will give them successful businesses so that they have no time for God, no time to get saved, no time to think about eternity. Maybe I just described someone in this meeting today. For you, preparation to meet God will always be for another day, some more convenient time until it is too late. You see, when Jonah was running from God on a holiday cruise to Tarshish, he was sleeping. He wasn't praying. He didn't begin to pray, in fact, until he was in the valley of the fish. And sometimes God would plunge you into the depths to get your attention. If you lost your health and your wealth, believe me, friend, it would be the best thing that could happen to you if it meant that you got saved or came back to the Lord. 
Jesus said, It is better for thee to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. The truth is, the more agony we experience and the more appealing the Lord becomes. I wonder if any are you in the depths of despair this evening. Then you should do what the psalms did here in verse 1 and cry to the Lord. Have you been living a life of vice rather than a life with Christ? Then friend, call to the Lord. You see, the one who cries from the depths will never be cast into the pit. The one who cries from the depths will one day sing in the heights. And when you cry to the Lord from the depths, he will lift you out of the depths. Just ask any real Christian. Everyone prays. Every religion urges people to pray, but very few cry to the Lord. Narrow is the way that leadeth to life, and few there be that find it, because very few cry. The psalmist says, This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. And you know, that poor man or that poor woman can be you tonight. If you're in the depths of sin, you're in the depths of danger. Because the wages of sin is dead. Your sin may kill your body through drink and drugs and STDs, but it will definitely destroy both your soul and your body in hell. The psalmist acknowledges God's infinite power here. He knows only God can help him. No distance, no depth, no difficulty can prevent his rescue. And you know, nothing will prevent your rescue except your own attitude to it. Satan would bring you down, down, down into darkness. But only Christ would lift you up, up, up into the light. Praise God, the most high is on standby to deliver the most low in Bottom Bridge this evening. Esther was queen. She was the king's wife, and yet she feared for her life when she approached the king. But you know, the king of glory tonight would delight to hear the cry from one repentant heart. Verse 2 says, Lord, hear my voice, that thy ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. You know, it's better to be heard by the Lord than to be answered by the Lord. You see, if the Lord answered yes to everything that we asked of him, we would have a cursing as well as a blessing in our lives. It would be like casting the responsibility of our own lives upon our own shoulders and what a mess that would turn out. We don't know what to ask for half the time. Believe me, it is enough to be heard by the Lord and to let him decide in his infinite wisdom how he should answer our petition. The Lord will hear our audible cry, but he will especially hear the silent voice of the weeping and the worrying and the sorrowful heart that has no tongue. This is a prayer of a beggar here to a king. He is under the painful burden of sin and in the depths of his unworthiness. You see, he begins here by saying, Lord, hear my voice. He doesn't come into the presence of the great king until he introduces himself, until he pauses not to do it the true room. He is fully aware of who he is about to address him. The Lord is always willing to answer the sinner's cry far more than we sinners are ready to ask him. But the fact that we come to the point where we need to pray and want to pray and are burdened to pray, but friend, that's proof enough to me that there is a God tonight. There is a God who exists. And God is real. You see, there is something within us that urges us to pray, something that evolution could never have inserted. The Creator desires a relationship with His creation just like any father desires a relationship with His son. The psalmist says, Be attentive to my voice, Lord. It reminds me of a child tugging on the hand of their mother for attention. Here I am, Mom. Look at me, Mom. Take notice of me. And indeed, the Lord will take notice of you. The moment you ask for his attention is the moment that you will receive it. He longs to hear from you, answer you, embrace you, forgive you, and save you. Verse 3 If thou, Lord, shouldst mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? 
It reminds me here of a great courtroom. The judge is on the bench, the criminal is in the dock charged with a capital offence. The witness is on the stand giving their evidence against him. The judge here is noting down every transgression, nothing is omitted, every sin is recorded. There is no escape from their deserved condemnation because the evidence here is overwhelming. In fact, a tiny fraction of proof of her sinful past is sufficient to determine our eternal destiny. James says, whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of the law. So the judge is left with no choice here but to pronounce our terrible sentence guilty. We're guilty. The all present, all seeing God in his perfect justice calls every man to account for everything that we have done and everything that we failed to do. Where would any one of us be tonight? Hell. That's where we would be. And yet, even though he records every sinful detail, every minute of every day, he does not immediately act upon it. He should act upon it, but he doesn't. That is for a future day that's coming. If we were all judged every time we sinned, we'd be thrown into hell a thousand times a day. The psalmist knows this and he confesses as a sinner. He knows he can't stand before God in his own righteousness. They are nothing but filthy rags to God. He is struck by the sense of the holiness of God and is convinced no man can answer for himself before this perfect judge. No wonder he cries, oh, O Lord, who shall stand? And the answer is, no one can stand. The psalmist says, they are all gone aside, they are all together. Become filthy, there is none that doeth good. No, not one. You know, we have a multitude of iniquities on our account tonight. Every thought, word, and work will be judged if not for the righteousness of Christ. We could never stand. I wonder will you dare to meet him with your sins still on your account, friend? If so, you're either the bravest man that ever lived or the biggest fool on the planet. I believe you're the latter. If a third of the angels fell from heaven and God marked their iniquities, then how will we stand? Even your best works are stained with sin and an active of righteousness. Oh, friend, don't be appear before God clothed in your own works. You'll be down. But appear before him clothed in his work, finished, completed on Calvary, and you'll be saved. Amen. Verse 4 says, But there is forgiveness with thee that thou mayest be feared. You know that little word, but, is a very, very significant word to us all tonight. Yes, there is hell full of demons. Yes, there is unquenchable fire. Yes, it is a place of weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Yes, you're going there if you're not saved. But, but, I know that little word, but, and friends, so should you. If it wasn't for that little word, but, the millions of saints already in heaven would be in hell. Sinner, you are standing on the brink of eternity tonight, about to be destroyed. But then this word, but, it pops up almost out of nowhere. It throws a spanner into the cogs of the great escalator descending down, down, down into the pit. But, 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 there is forgiveness with God. Hallelujah. A full, free pardon is in the hands of the great king tonight. His prerogative is to give and forgive, and he delights to do it. It's in his nature to show hell deserving rebels like you and me mercy. What amazing grace. He has declared only that blood sacrifice will be sufficient. Not only that, he has provided that perfect sacrifice for sin in his own son. His forgiveness is with him, but it is an offer to you. If you come confessing, repenting, and trusting in Christ. The power to pardon you permanently rests with him alone, you see. 
not in a priest or minister, not in a church or a chapel, not in ordinances or sacraments, but in Christ. Forgiveness is at the ready at this instant if you are ready to receive it. It takes a special man to forgive one sin of a cheating wife. In fact, it takes a special woman to forgive one sin of a cheating husband. So how special is God this evening if he's willing to forgive us millions of sins of our life? What love is it? What was it that brought the prodigal son to his senses and began that long journey home? Was it his distress, the disgrace, the poverty? Was it eating the pig's food, soiling himself, wetting himself, waking up in his own vomit? No. No. He remembered he had a loving father, waiting, watching, wanting to welcome his son home. A father who would run to meet him, throw his arms around him, and forgive him. The thought of hell may bring you to your spiritual senses like it did the prodigal, but only the belief that there is a loving father in heaven waiting, wanting, and ready to offer you away out of your sin, away out of the pit, away out of the depths, only that will bring you home. Will you finally come home tonight, friend? You know, he loves you so much and wants to be loved by you that rather than go without your love, he longs to pardon you. Of course, popular and easy believism will tell you that now that you're saved, you can do whatever you like. Well, you know, if that's your attitude, then you have no fear of God and you're definitely not saved. You can think you're saved because of a wee prayer that you said many, many, many years ago. And there's never been a change in your life, then the fact is you're depending on what you have done, not what Christ has done for you. You're depending on your own works. That's what you're depending on. And it's not all works. You cannot fear God unless you have been forgiven and changed by God. The greater the mercy, the greater the fear, and none fear God more than those who have experienced His forgiveness. Gratitude for pardon produces more fear and reverence for a holy God than all the dread which is inspired by an eternal punishment. If God were to exercise judgment and give us all what we deserve tonight, there would be no one left to fear. Those who love him most will fear him most. It will be a fear of grieving him, dishonoring him, being unfaithful to him, letting him down. Wonder if you have ground in the ear of the God. So there's the appeal of this to the Savior. We also see verses 5 and 6 the anticipation of salvation. I wait for the Lord, my soul doth wait, and in his word do I hope. My soul waiteth for the Lord more than they that watch for the morning, I say more than they that watch for the morning. Like the Christian. The psalmist here is now waiting expectantly in faith for the Lord's, Lord's appearing. Speaking of the Lord's second coming, Paul said, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the day of Christ shall rise first. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. You know, God's people have always been waiting for the Lord. His first appearing in Bethlehem was announced by the archangel Gabriel. His second coming will be announced by the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. And you know, friend, we have not long to wait now. We can be sure of that. The psalmist is a picture of the believer hanging in faith upon Christ, expecting him any day now to fulfill that promise, I will come again to receive you unto myself. The believer should be waiting for his return. And nothing more than that. Not waiting for the lottery win. Not waiting for a family inheritance so that you can fight the world with your relatives. Not waiting for investments or stocks and shares to increase in value, but waiting for Christ. Waiting for Christ to return is a good thing because he's worth waiting for. But it also means God is giving more time to sinners to repent. 
You see, friend, we are now in the very last days, and every day from now on is a bonus day. It is an extension of the grace of God. Christians used to wait for salvation, but now we wait for complete and perfect sanctification. A lot of people haven't got on the first roll of the ladder yet. Some are still in the depths, some are still waiting for salvation. Friend, but God, as you wait no longer, for how much longer do you have? Boast not myself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring. You know, the word of God is the source of our waiting. The word gives us hope tonight. If you have hope, or if you have no hope, then you cannot wait. The psalmist says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, the light unto my path. Thy word is very pure, therefore thy servant loveth it. You love the word tonight, friend. Jesus says, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Thy word is true. Paul says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God. So as we wait upon the Lord, let us study the word, believe in the word, hope in the word, trust in the word, rest in the word, live in the word, and as verse 6 says, Watch. Watch. In fact, Jesus says, What I say unto you, I say unto all. Watch. Be ye therefore ready also for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when ye think not. See, we're all to watch. But while the saint can watch in confidence, the sinner can only watch in horror as the day of the Lord approaches and comes in like a thief in the night. Way back in 18 and 30, it was the night before the 1st of August, when all the slaves of the West Indian colonies would finally be set free. It's hard to believe that not too many years ago people were slaves. But you know that like some people, some of those slaves, they couldn't sleep. Some never went to bed. Some actually went to church to praise God for what was coming. Some couldn't wait for the dawn. They were so excited. It was as if that sun would, would, was standing still and would never rise again. So some of them decided they would climb the nearest mountain to catch a glimpse of the first view of their first day of freedom. Once that sun appeared over the horizon as it had done every morning for thousands of years before, they signaled to their brethren in the valley that the day of their deliverance had come. Men and women whom God had created with souls in his image to live forever, would finally be set free. Oh, how these men must have watched for the first glimpse of sunshine, and now their wait was finally over. Friend, be that watchman. Take to the hills and valleys, enter those towns and cities, walk those highways and hedges and compel them to come in so that the Father's house might be saved. And then if you're not saved, let this be the day of your deliverance. Be like those West Indian slaves. Don't go to sleep tonight. Don't go to bed tonight until you get right with God. For how do you know that your soul may be drifted over the dead end? God has created you with a soul in his image to live forever. Have you been delivered yet? Have you finally been set free? There was the appeal to the Savior, the anticipation of salvation. Finally, in the last two verses, we have the advice here to the sinner. Verse 7, that Israel hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy, and with him is plenteous redemption. The psalmist waiting and the watching were all personal. And confined in his own situation, but now it is no longer I, but us, it is no longer himself, but all of us. This one Israelite who was once in the depths of despair had tasted and seen that the Lord was good. God had fulfilled every promise to his soul. He had been rescued from the depths of debauchery and the pit of the damned. Now he simply wants all of us to have what he had. This message, you see, was not a treasure to be hoarded for himself. It was a gift to be shared with the multitudes. And you know, that's the way it has always been. What a message we have tonight. 
Jesus tells us to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. COVID or no COVID, preach it, brother. Preach it, sister. People are dying tonight. We have the vaccine. The precious blood of Christ. Paul said, I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. My heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. And you know, this will be the priority of every truly born again child of God as well. Spurgeon says, Have you no wish for others to be saved? Then you're not saved yourself. Be sure of that. The psalmist has set the example here. He has tried and tested God's only formula for salvation, which is repentance toward God, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It had worked for him, and he was convinced it would work for his nation. Can I say it, my friend? I totally agree with the sounds to you. Because Christ has worked for me. And Christ will work for you. Paul says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. You see, you can't attempt to straighten others out before you are straightened out yourself. And only the Lord can straighten out men who are dead in trespasses and sins. That's where the unsaved clergyman goes wrong. He's trying to guide his congregation through the darkness and the filth of this wicked world when he himself is still as blind as a bat. The psalmist has received mercy. He has been redeemed. He's been purchased with the blood of Christ. And thank God will do the same for you. The promise of mercy and deliverance are good enough reason to trust in the Lord because there is certainly no mercy and deliverance to be found anywhere else tonight. Neither is there salvation in any other, but there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Is this not a great comfort to you, sinner, tonight? That whilst you may be in the depths, you can cry for mercy and redemption. You might still be in the depths right now. But friend, it is better to be in the depths with the voice to cry for mercy and redemption and go to heaven than to be at ease on the mountain top of your own good works and self-righteousness and end up in hell. There once was a man on his deathbed, his moments to live, drawing his last breath, and the pastor faithfully urged that man and pleaded with him to call upon the name of the Lord, but the man insisted that he was good enough. Pastor moved from the side of the bed to the bottom of the bed, where all of a sudden he picked up an awful stench of burning sulfur, just as that man on the bed was slipping out into eternity. Did the pastor pick up the stench of hell? As that portal door from the physical world to the spiritual world briefly opened and shut again? You tell me. I tell you tonight that I am not that I am not even a on it. Where are you? Then cry for his mercy tonight. Take good advantage of this good and be pardoned for your crime to be able to revenge. He alone can bring light into your darkness, strength to your weakness, deliverance from danger, and triumph over death. He is the same God yesterday, today, and forever. He never changes. He won't let you down, and he will not push you away. What the psalmist was given way back then is being given to you today. And what he promises to you, he will provide for you. Verse 8 says he should redeem Israel from all his own. You know, friend, our iniquities are our worst, our very worst injury. They are the ultimate threat to our souls. And if we're saved from them, that we will be saved all together. This redemption includes the forgiveness of sins, the breaking of the power over sin, and the setting free from all the consequences of sin. The Lord redeems his people from all their iniquities, so obviously he is plenteous and merciful. And dear sinner, that's what you need more than the air you breathe tonight. God's mercy. And praise God, he is rich in mercy. All our iniquities are redeemed. The lustful eye, the listening ear, the lying lips, the thoughts of your heart which are only evil continually. 
iniquities of imagination and memory and pride and covetousness and self-righteousness and hypocrisy and sensuality. And the good news is there is redemption for all. It involves all people and all sin. Not one will be left. Not a trace, not a shadow, all gone, all buried, all gone out, all swallowed up, all free and pardoned, and all cast as far as the east is from the west. He shall redeem emphatically, vigorously, categorically, and alone for none other time. Yes, in the word of false religion tonight, the priest may send you away to do penance, but only Jesus Christ will embrace you with a pardon. What a wonderful end it is to this psalm. You know, this psalm has taken the repentant sinner from crying unto God in the depths of despair to praising God in the heights of delight. In fact, it opens with soul ruination, but it closes with soul restoration. Now, friend, what will you do with this mercy and forgiveness? The God is offering you this evening. A pardon is available, but we know that a pardon can also be refused. In fact, millions are refusing it tonight. Will you be one of them? When your life draws to a close, will your soul be destined for the depths of hell? Or will it be on route to the heights of glory? Yes, your life began in soul ruination because you were born in sin. But friend, it doesn't have to end in soul ruination. Tonight, you can make sure that it ends in soul restoration. Friend, be like that prodigal son. And come home to the Father's house. We'll turn and go thank you again. In number 362. 362. Have you any room for Jesus? He who bore your load of sin, and as he knocks and asks admission, sin will you let him in. We'll stand as we sing.